Do you ever think about bread? Bread comes in a multitude of styles and varieties, but at its core, the primary component of every bread is some sort of carbohydrate. Some breads derive their carbohydrates from corn, others from potatoes, but here in America, the most common source of carbohydrates is wheat flour. The anatomy of a grain is pretty straightforward. It's a tough outer hull, which encloses a thick layer of what's called bran, which houses a mass of endosperm and an embryo-containing packet called a germ. During the milling process, the whole bran and germ are removed, leaving the endosperm, which is not only easier to digest, but is rich in carbohydrates and also contains some proteins and minerals as well. The ground-up endosperm is what we call flour, and different types of flour contain different amounts of different parts of the grain. So white flour is just the endosperm, which itself is about 75% of the grain, but brown flour uses a little bit of the germ and a little bit of the bran as well, utilizing about 85% of the total grain. And whole grain flour uses, you guessed it, the whole grain. The germ, the bran, the endosperm, all of it. The only thing that's removed is the hull. The point is, at the end of this process, what you're left with is just powdered plant matter. And when you think about what that plant matter is, and what it evolved for, and what you're about to do with it, the whole situation just gets so much weirder. Consider, for example, an egg. An egg contains an embryo, a yolk to feed it, albumin to hydrate it, and a hard outer shell to protect it. The whole point of an egg is to house and nourish a developing embryo in the most efficient and self-contained way possible. Seeds are like plant eggs. They contain an embryo, as well as several nutrient-rich structures to supply them during their delicate first period of life. The endosperm within a seed is similar to the yolk of an egg. Its role is to support embryonic growth by providing vital nutrients in the face of irregular and unpredictable conditions in the external environment. That makes flour essentially a powdered omelet. It's the pulverized and desiccated yolks of plant eggs. Except instead of being protein rich, it's carbohydrate rich. And that is nowhere near the weirdest thing about bread. Carbohydrates, as we've talked about in other videos, are just chains of sugars. Monosaccharides are just one sugar, disaccharides are two sugars, oligosaccharides are three to ten sugars, and polysaccharides can contain hundreds or even thousands of sugars. Common polysaccharides in plants include cellulose, which makes up their cell walls, and starch, which is usually found in the roots for long-term energy storage. So now that we've extracted the sugar from the grain and ground it into dust, we face a new problem which is that the dust isn't delicious in its current state. So to address that issue, we need to turn the dust into goo by mixing it with usually water, but sometimes something else like milk. And that's how you get dough, a suspension of polymer solids and a pinch of salt taking the form of a non-Newtonian fluid. I mentioned before that bread is mostly carbohydrates, but it also does contain some protein. Now, the specific type and amount of protein found within bread varies a lot between the different types of bread in question. But the one thing that is ubiquitous across the bread kingdom is that it is the protein that gives the bread its structure by forming long, stretchy chains. But probably the most common bread protein, the one found in things like wheat, barley, and rye, is called gluten. The process of kneading bread dough forms those gluten chains into an elastic network of fibers that can make the dough light and fluffy or dense and chewy, depending on your culinary styles and trophic preferences. Now at this point, you can cook the goo and produce from it a variety of delicious unleavened breads like tortillas or matzah or roti. But if you want something a little bit squishier and softer, you're gonna need to add another ingredient. And more often than not, that's gonna be a fungus. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, otherwise known as brewer's yeast, baker's yeast, or just yeast. It's a species of single-celled fungus that can be found absolutely everywhere. Yeast is found all over plants, in fruit, in soils, or just floating in the air all around the globe. One of the most reliable ways to get yeast, besides just going down to the store and buying some, is to take a little bit of dried fruit and put it in a jar with some water and leave it in an open window for a few days. Before you know it, you'll have a bubbly, fizzy little jar of fruity yeast water. 
But don't confuse yeast with mold. Mold is totally different. Mold is multicellular and it does totally different stuff in totally different ways. There are over a thousand different species of yeast and not all of them are that great. But Baker's yeast specifically is arguably the most important fungus in the history of human civilization. And it's all because of its incredible ability to convert sugar into carbon dioxide and ethanol. And when I say convert, I mean that in the same way that you convert cheeseburgers into poop. Yeast eats sugar, uses it as chemical energy to live, and its waste products are carbon dioxide and ethanol. We call this process of microorganisms chemically breaking something down fermentation. And it's how cheese and beer and wine and sauerkraut and kimchi and rum and whiskey and miso and lots of other food and drinks are made. And if that thought grosses you out, welcome to biology class. You have no idea how much you rely on the waste products of other organisms to survive every single day. And you rely on fermentation in a lot of ways you might not expect. For example, I mentioned ethanol as being one of the byproducts. Ethanol is a two carbon alcohol, which does a lot more than just make alcoholic beverages. It also makes pharmaceutical compounds and cosmetics and perfumes. And it's even added to gasoline to make fuel prices cheaper. Did you ever stop and wonder how corn and sugarcane are helping your car run right now? That's all yeast, dude. And because yeast is so monumentally versatile and so incredibly important, it's also very well studied. Yeast is the best understood genetic model organism that we have. It's used in genetics and biochemistry and microbiology research around the world. It was the first eukaryote to have its genome completely sequenced. And it's like the most accessible genome that we have for genetic manipulation and testing. Yeast has been the source of so many major breakthroughs in so many different fields of biology. This tiny little microorganism has taught us more about life than almost anything else. So, getting back to bread. In microbiology, we use the term inoculation for the process of introducing a microorganism to a culture so that it can reproduce there. And that, without changing the meaning of any of the words, is exactly what you are doing when you put yeast into your bread dough. You're inoculating the goo with fungi so that the fungi can reproduce, eat the sugars contained within the goo, and fart out carbon dioxide, which will then get trapped within the elastic polymer network that you massaged into existence earlier so that the goo will get bigger. And of course, fermentation does also produce ethyl alcohol, but that all evaporates out during baking anyway, so really it's just the farts that you're after. The farts are the key. And depending on how long you let the yeast do their thing, you get different kinds of bread. Your average white bread is left to ferment for a couple of hours. Sourdough ferments from a few hours to a day. Ethiopian injera is left to ferment for several days before cooking. It all depends on how long you let the fungus eat the goo. But of course, we don't like to talk like that, so we call the whole process of plant goo becoming increasingly more alcoholic as it swells with fungus farts rising, and I think that's cowardly. But suppose that you want fluffy bread but you don't want the gases that change the nature of your goo to be exclusively biogenic. So you decide to eschew controlled fungal infections from your culinary repertoire. Luckily for you, you still have options. Soda is a term used to describe certain chemical compounds which contain sodium. In fact, the word sodium comes from the word soda. And there's lots of different kinds of soda out there like sodium hydroxide, or caustic soda, which is used in a lot of commercial drain cleaners, or washing soda, or soda ash, which is used in glass manufacturing. And then there's baking soda, which is also known as sodium bicarbonate or bicarbonate of soda. Baking soda occurs naturally in an ore called nacolite, or it can be derived from another ore called trona, which is heated to produce soda ash and then treated with CO2. And yeah, you heard me right. These are ores, as in mineral rich solid matter dug up out of the ground. Most of the baking soda that we have here in the US comes from trona ore mined in the Green River Basin in Wyoming. And just like caustic soda or soda ash, baking soda is a base, which means that it has a high pH and will react with acid, which has a low pH. Now think about Irish soda bread, which is made of flour, baking soda, and buttermilk. Buttermilk is sour because of the presence of lactic acid, produced by the fermentation of the milk sugar lactose by bacteria. This is why pasteurized milk lasts longer, because all those bacteria are killed off. Commercially produced buttermilk is pasteurized first, then it's inoculated with a controlled amount of specific species of bacteria to make sure that it ferments just the right amount and in just the right way to be safe for human consumption. 
When the sodium bicarbonate interacts with the lactic acid in the buttermilk, they react to produce carbon dioxide gas, just like a science fair volcano. And that's what causes the bread to rise. And in case you're wondering, baking powder is just baking soda mixed with a weak acid like cream of tartar and some sort of buffer like cornstarch to make sure they don't react prematurely. It's the exact same kind of reaction you get in Irish soda bread, just prepped and ready in a can. It was invented in the 1840s by a chemist named Alfred Bird so that his wife, who was allergic to yeast, could finally enjoy bread. And when you think about that, all we really did was learn a cool chemistry trick so that we could stop relying on the yeast to do their cool chemistry trick. We, we, we dug something up out of the ground and used it to replace the mushrooms. We stopped using fungi and started using dirt all so that we could produce the same gas that we all breathe out all day long in the hopes of making fluffier goo. And then there's the process of baking, which despite what you might expect, is not just heating up the goo to evaporate out the moisture. It's actually a little bit more complex than that. Because remember, the goo is predominantly made of carbohydrates and proteins, which themselves are made of sugars and amino acids respectively. When sugars and proteins are heated together to high temperatures, they undergo what's called the Maillard reaction where they break apart into their individual constituents and then reform together in stochastic and unpredictable ways in order to create a wide variety of compounds called melanoidins. Melanoidins are brown in color, and they're what gives seared steak and toasted marshmallows and roasted coffee and bread crust and all your other favorite golden brown food exteriors their distinctive aromas and flavors. Now stop for a second and think about what caramel is. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's sugars and proteins reacting together until they turn brown and taste good. That's what you do when you brown something. You essentially turn the outer surface into a sort of caramel. When you bake bread, you are caramelizing the fungus inflated plant goo. You monster. Bread is one of those things that you just can't overlook if you're into science. It's a fascinating blend of chemistry, history, and flavor that permeates every culture in the world in one way or another. Bread is so universal to the human experience that we have phrases like breaking bread, which means more than just sharing a meal, it means unity and peace and community and reconciliation. And there's research to back this practice up. Psychological studies have shown that sharing food, the literal breaking of bread, improves the outcome of negotiations, boosts cooperation, and is associated with deeper feelings of trust, increased community engagement, and feelings of personal happiness and satisfaction. Bread is a vehicle for social bonding, a link to all of our pasts, and a great source of carbohydrates. It's something that we rely on, something that we celebrate, and all too often, something that we take for granted. And even that is a wonderful development. How lucky are we that so many of us get to appreciate this rather than having to appreciate this. But no matter how beautiful and interesting and psychologically compelling and culturally significant bread may be, it is, in essence, fundamentally, goo. It's goo made from plant sugars, usually fermented by microorganisms, and then heated just long enough to kill off the intrinsic fungi, but not long enough to burn the goo. And that's my favorite thing about science. It changes the way you see the whole world around you. If you're a passionately curious person, questions burn like acid in your brain until you can't help but go find an answer and be delighted by what you find. That's how this whole video started. I've talked about bread in similar ways to this on other platforms, but I realized while making a loaf of soda bread the other day to serve with dinner that I had no idea where baking soda came from. And as soon as I looked it up, I got so excited about it that I realized I had to make this whole video about bread and bread's implications. And if you like learning cool things too, I encourage you to check out the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an everyday learning app that lets students, professionals, and everyday people alike explore real STEM lessons with hands-on activities and low-pressure lessons. And if you go to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai, you can try it for free for 30 days and get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium. Few people have the cash or the spare time to take an extra college course whenever they're curious about something. That's why Brilliant is built for busy people. Whether you want to advance your career with new skills or just learn a new thing about the universe that you live in, Brilliant is a great way to do it. 
I genuinely enjoy using Brilliant, and I genuinely enjoy being sponsored by them, since the main point of this channel is to learn new stuff. So if you want to learn some cool new things in a cool new way, head on over to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai, or just use the link in the description below to try it out for free for a full 30 days, and if you like it, get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium. I have no idea how to end this video, but thank you so much for watching it, have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Fred!